Cool. So, what we're going to talk about today is Kafka, Kubernetes, and event driven microservices. So, who I've heard Kubernetes a couple of times. Like people, how many of you are working with Kubernetes? How many of you are interested to hearing about Kubernetes? More about. Awesome. <laughs> Kafka, working with Kafka, want to hear about Kafka. Perfect. So what we're going to talk today really is I, I'd really like to bring uh, you know, a few ideas about how to build these types of distributed systems, because this, this is really what event-driven microservices are. Like, because this is what microservice architectures are, and in particular, event-driven microservices is a, you know, as a um, better way of interconnecting these systems, these distributed systems. And essentially looking at how Kafka and how Kubernetes basically helps running these microservices, how Kafka helps interconnecting these microservices, and how can we build it all on top of Kubernetes, right? And uh, some of the problems, actually, that, uh, that were you have to solve essentially when running Kafka and Kubernetes, and how these are solved in in a uh, you know with a solution called the uh, StreamZ operator that uh, is developed in the community. How many of, how many of you are familiar with with StreamZ? I've seen it. A couple show of hands. So hopefully after tonight you're going to be more familiar with it. So that's kind of part of the uh, what I have in mind for tonight. Now bear in mind that this is a presentation with slides, with demos and everything, but we are all here together, so don't feel afraid to raise your hand, ask questions, derail things. Like that's what we are here to have a conversation, right? Please do that, right? Sounds good? Awesome. Um, before being just a little bit more about myself, before being an engineer, uh, before being a solution architect, I was an engineer. I was part of the Spring team. I was contributing to Spring integration, uh, Spring integration Kafka. I led a project called Spring Cloud Streams, which was basically the stream processing uh, extension to Spring Boot. Uh, so a lot of the, I, I've been working with, with Kafka, I think, for uh, more than four years now, almost five. And uh, again, part of the, what I'm talking about today kind of reflects my view on, on, on how to use it, how things work, and what you, know, what you should have, have in mind there. And you know, first, why do we even build microservices? That's, that's, the, main, that's the first question. Right? How many of you are, are, are developing microservices currently? Quite a show of hands. How many of you want to develop, want to move to microservices? And how many of you have to move to microservices because their boss tells them to? <laughs> <laughs> no. Like, well, I see that there's not a lot of discipline here. No hands shown at the last question. But uh, no, I think, I think the microservices have a mix of like, mixed hype with practical utility. And you know, if you, it, they're, they're a complex topic. But they solve real problems and they offer real opportunities. The question is like to the the the, the point is to ask the right questions and to find the right motivations for implementing. Now, typically, the rise of microservices really like if you look at the spectrum between uh, operational efficiency, which for historical reasons has basically drawn us to monoliths and application servers and generally speaking things that you know can be concentrated on physical or, or virtual machines because acquiring physical and virtual machines was actually a very hard task, right? It, it's really like not that easy to add a new component, like a new physical or virtual machine into the system. And we start wondering about costs. We try to concentrate things. We try to kind of put together uh, uh, like everything and make it kind of as, as monolithic as possible. Right? And that's, it's been like that for a long, long time. Right? Until the rise of you know, cloud platforms, uh, until we started having more options like uh, containers, you know, machines that we can, you know, cloud, as I said, cloud platforms, things like Amazon that allowed you to basically go with a credit card and just start new instances that you can tailor and do that kind of stuff. And you have access to things like that and probably cost is still a concern. But all of a sudden, you discover that because you can move faster, you start thinking, okay, 
how can, how can I get to the point where I'm implementing these things as fast as possible? And that's where kind of the, the, the idea came from that of, of thinking, well, obsessing about putting things together, you know, obsessing about always having like uh, a release every six months or every year because everything has to come together as part of a whole is actually slowing us, it's slowing every one of us down. Maybe breaking things apart and starting releasing them independently, uh, putting them and connect, like connecting them independently, and most importantly, running them independently, given the fact that we have access to this uh, readily available hardware is kind of a better idea. So, you know, that's fine, but what exactly do we do? What, did, what does fast value delivery mean? And what's the value, really? Well, they can be different things. We can fix things easier in a component if we know that we can release and run it independently. We can implement new features faster because you know, we can just put it in one component and it doesn't affect the rest of the, whole, uh, uh, of the whole topology. We can run experiments. Like all of a sudden we can try new features and uh, validate assumptions much faster. That's super valuable. That allows businesses to grow, right? That's basically moving IT from the cost center, like really people that have to be paid less and less and less and less, to a value producer where they create new and new value, and all of a sudden they become more valuable to the, like, for companies. And that basically kind of increases the confidence in the development process, knowing that we can fix things easier, that we can add features easier, and so on. I mean, that's. That's a, that's a big win. And that's sort of, that's the argument for, and that's the kind of the, 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 the major attraction towards this type of, of architecture. And not all of this necessarily means that, like you can, I would say that the, like the journey to microservices is really a journey, right? Some, a lot of these things you can, can be done through discipline modularization inside existing applications and, and like you don't necessarily have to break everything in, in a thousand of things running separately, right? But in a, you know, no pun intended, the end game is to actually have them running uh, separately. And that's super cool. Now, what happens when you actually start breaking these things apart is that they have to start communicating with each other. They, you really have to put them back together, and that's not easy. There are many things that can happen, like, and, and many, um, there, there are, you know, there are many assumptions that you can make in a monolithic application that you cannot make in a distributed system anymore. Start with the, you know, the reliable network fallacy. The abstraction is leaky. Like, the network can fail in many, many ways. So how do you deal with that? You didn't have this problem before. You have to think about it. Communication is critical. And there are a ton of other things that are critical to, to microservice architectures. I will talk tonight about two. I will talk about running them, like where Kubernetes comes into play, and having them communicate with each other, when Kafka comes into play. But there are so many other things. Security. Like, how do I know that a microservice that invokes another microservice is who it says it is? Like, how do I know that I don't have, like, in this topology, a, you know, some other thing coming through and making calls? And where, how do I know where these things came from? You know, that's important. Um, again, observability. Like, how do I know, like, if I have a failed request going over a chain of microservices, how do I know where things failed? Which one is the, the laggy component? Like, that was a problem before in, in the monolith. Like, if you were, if you were, implementing those things, you're kind of worried about that. But they become very important in this type of architecture, right? Again, leaving that aside, let's see how these things talk to each other. Um, the important part is that we're almost four years now in this conversation about, uh, about microservice. And, you know, if you look at Martin Fowler's blog, it's like 2015, and we're still kind of wonder about how do we do, th how to do these things better and so on. So the benefits and the drawbacks were known and I would put at the top of the list <laughs> two of them. Operational complexity and even more importantly distribution. We really are 
like when we do microservices, we deliberately have chosen to implement distributed systems. We have to deal with that complexity, right? So how do we get, how do we put these things together? What are the communication patterns that happen in these systems? How do we kind of derive event-driven architecture as a, you know, as a desirable communication model? And why is it like that? Um, it turns out, you know, it, the best way to look at it is by contrast with um, request reply interaction, which is by far the most common way of, 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 uh, of uh, systems interact. Like we, of course, we had messaging, and I mean, how many of you have worked in applications that use mess with applications that use messaging, right? Please show of hands, but not everyone. So, the the reality is that while asynchronous communication is understood and is not being kind of a new problem, it's never been seen as part of a you know, it, it's not being seen as part of the problem domain. It's more of a, hey, I have this, like I have these two systems, I can make them communicate asynchronously, right? And that's pretty much it. Request reply, on the other hand, has developed, like has been very much looked into. We have ways of telling whether a specific application is restful or not restful. We have ways to argue about resources in a restful application have to be plural or singular. Like it's, there's a lot of thinking going on in that space whether GraphQL is compatible with REST or not. And like, there's a lot of SOAP has been around for a long time. So we, we, we put a lot of thought in request reply interaction. But when you look at it for, for uh, distributed systems, you can see that it's based on a uh, communication model that is inherently ephemeral. Uh, there's a client, there's a server, there's an interaction that might not survive if any of these component crashes, right? It's simple because it replicates what we know from you know, direct communication between pro, uh, inside applications, right? Synchronous calls, when we call a function, we kind of tend to extend the same thinking to, uh, to a REST call. On the other hand, you have event-driven communication that's based on the idea that there is an entity, the event, that uh, survives the interaction. That, that the, procedure, the producer and the consumers are, are independent of each other, and you know, the event is essentially mediates the communication between two. They two don't know anything about each other. What makes this attractive is that, especially for large distributed systems, is that besides the, besides the decoupling, besides the resiliency, like if any of these components fails, like if, for example, the producer fails, the consumer can still consume data without necessarily needing to communicate back to the, uh, to the, to send a response to the client as it would be in the case of request reply. Uh, it's composable. Like if you follow, follow a published, imagine that we would have to have another component in a request reply environment that would have to, uh, you know, participate in this request reply. You can't. You have to make another request to another server to basically broadcast that request to multiple components. Whereas in, like in a messaging system, if you have a publish subscribe model, you can just add new components in the topology and they would be recipients of messages. So the model is, 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 is much more extensive. The problem is that overall this is a much more, as I said, is a mar much more complex model and the practices are not very well understood. Like if you just look at the state of the art for, you know, for, uh, Synchronous APIs, like things like Swagger and Open API, and basically there is an entire tooling, there is an entire literature, there is an entire versioning around it. If you look at things like the, at similar things, you can have things like async API, for example, which are just an incipient effort and are trying to define themselves. It's just the 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 space has not evolved uh, uh, far enough. The the key here, and I don't want to kind of dwell too much on it, is that event-driven architecture reduces friction from both a technical development process standpoint and from a business standpoint. What are we looking at here when we think about event-driven microservices is these really self-contained units that talk to each other over well-known uh, addresses, over well-known queues or topics. 
And that's the kind of thing that you can implement with, uh, with any kind of, really, of messaging middleware. Right? And you know, it's the, the, the goal is to kind of take the, uh, what you have right now, like things like Spring Boot, Spring Integration, Camel, applications like that, and you can basically start building these types of, of architectures on top of commodity middleware, commodity messaging middleware. Now, the key challenge here, I'm, I'm skipping a few slides because they kind of repeat some of the points that I kind of mentioned. The key challenge here is how does messaging evolve to keep track with this model? This is where Kafka comes, like things like Kafka come into play, right? And if you look at Kafka itself, essentially, it defined itself in many ways. So what I'm, I'm, what I'm putting here is the different definitions that Kafka has, like uh, that ha Kafka has given itself, the things that you can find over the years in the in the documentation. Uh, you know, messaging reinvented as a distributed log, a published subscribe messaging system, and a data streaming platform. And it kind of reflects the growth of the ecosystem, right? From the system of brokers to like adding new libraries like Kafka Streams, Kafka Connect, uh, the other components, for example, in the Confluent ecosystem, the other compo component, components in the community, right? But at the core is essentially the broker system, right? And what Kafka has done and what's so different about it when you think about compared to, to, to uh, uh, traditional messaging and essentially moving away from the traditional model of the queue like, traditional messaging systems have been designed with the idea of being store and forward components that uh, essentially mediate the communication between two known entities. Right? That's pretty much what it is. All, everything that's inside, even, even the, like if you look at things like topics, for example, in those types of, of environments, are based on the notion that uh, consumers Consumers are known in advance. Subscribers are known in advance. Um, you know, even if even if you're implementing pub sub in such an environment, for example, you will receive a subscriber to a topic will receive only messages emitted after the uh, after the subscriber has actually subscribed. Right? Why? Because it's the responsibility of the brokers to keep track of who subscribes to what, and to forward messages to those subscribers. And that scales only so far. Like That works well when you have a limited number of systems, and you have a limited number of components that are in your, sy that are in your system. But when you actually start scaling, and when you think about microservices in particular, those, those things scale on two dimensions. One is the sheer number of logical components. The other one is the number of instances that these components have. So you can end up very easily with tens of hun or hundreds of instances talking to each other. You don't want to put that burden on, 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 on the broker. So the model of, of Kafka is basically based on the idea that the brokers, it's not the broker's responsibility to keep track of what the consumers do. Right? The, the broker is just a repository for messages which are appended as part of a distributed log. It's essentially, there's like, it is essentially a process that sits on a gigantic file system where everything is appended sequentially. Right? And that's pretty much it. And everyone who wants to consume those messages has to make requests for receiving and basically reading messages sequentially from these files. Right? And that a lot of things come from that, like optimizations like fast writes, of course, because if you write sequentially, you're actually going to write very fast. Um, you're going to read fast, of course, because if you're actually reading from the page cache, you're going to read sequentially very, very fast. Right? So, you know, the, this, is kind of com this is combined with the idea of high availability built into the system itself. It's not like the, from, from the get-go, there is an assumption that you know, 
uh, messages and you know all the data is essentially spread uh, across the cluster, and you know every <coughs> every topic, every partition in a topic essentially has a um, number of copies. One of each copy is essentially being on a broker that's considered the leader. Like who's the who? Which broker is the leader for what partition is actually something that you know brokers decides among themselves. You know, as part of a distributed system negotiation. But anytime, and this is important because that gives brokers identity, and essentially that means that brokers own their file systems. And this is this has implications a little bit later on when we're going to discuss how you run Kafka on Kubernetes. For example. Now, of course, if one of these brokers crashes, then the part, a new leader partition is elected, and the significance of these uh, of these leaders is that clients interact di directly with the leaders, and that's another interesting aspect of, of Kafka. Normally, in a, in a traditional messaging system, you would talk through, like, there is some sort of load balancing that, a, uh, that you know, one of the brokers would do and would defer the work to the others. In the case of Kafka, actually, the clients talk directly to the brokers that actually are the leaders that they're, of the partitions that they're interested in. Again, this gives you, you know, kind of throughput, increased throughput abilities, because obviously, Consumer 2, for example, and consumer 3 are not competing for network resources, I'm sorry, when they're trying to talk to get, when they're trying to get data from, from the partitions that they're interested in, right? In the same way, producers 2 and producer 1 are not competing for, for network when they're actually talking to the, to the brokers. Like you can get very high throughput. But of course, it also has the consequence that consumers have to be able to access brokers directly. And that's another, that's another interesting thing that we're going to talk about when we, when we talk about running on Kubernetes. The other interesting, uh, the other interesting uh, feature of Kafka is the notion of consumer groups. And that is a pretty big deal. Now, a topic in Kafka is divided in and I kind of glossed through that, but I'm going to come back to it. A topic is divided in a number of partitions. Data is written on these partitions either in a round-robin fashion, or it is written uh, under the control of the client. So you can, for example, can you can, for example, collocate data that is semantically related, like data all the interactions of a specific customer, or all the data from a specific sensor in an IoT system. That's also important because clients always consume data from, like, one given partition is always sent to a particular client. So data is received, like, cohesively and ordered by the client, right? The problem is, okay, that's fine. We understand that you can have a partition, you can have, you can have each partition basically sent to one and only one consumer. You can have multiple consumers, which means that they're going to divide the partitions among themselves. That's excellent. What if I have two things, two different things that I want to solve at the same time? First, I want to have two different logical applications that want to consume data of that partition. And I want to have multiple instances of these logical applications. Which one wins? Should the partitions be distributed among all these instances, and then only half, like an application will get half of the data, the other, hand, the other one will get half of the data. That's just crazy, right? Or everyone gets copies of the data, and every instance gets all the data, and that's equally crazy. So basically, this is where Kafka introduces the concept of consumer groups, which means that instances can be grouped together and can be declared as being part of the same group. And the idea is that instances that are part of separate groups are in a publish subscribe relationship with each other, like the groups themselves. Like all groups will get all the data, but inside a group, 
the partitions, and therefore the data of the topic will be divided. <clears throat> now, this has another important implication. The, 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 one of the implications of this is that um, is how much you can scale the consumers of a given topic. Right? Um, a partition, you cannot have more instances in a group that, than you have partitions. I mean, you can have more instances than you have partitions, but some of them will, be just, will just stay idle because each partition has to go to a specific consumer in a specific group. Right. Now, the, the challenge, and again, when you, when you design these applications, right, is trying to think how many partitions should you actually put in. And usually, kind of the, 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 the tendency is to over partition both for distributing data more evenly and also for, ins for ensuring like higher limits for, for concurrency. Of course, when you think about writing this in a distributed system, you already have to deal with a large number of instances that have to be considered, that have to be configured coherently, have to share the same configuration and have to be basically, um, you know, uh, you know, you want, for example, to make sure that you know this type of configuration is essentially sends and it's it's applied consistently to 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 all these different instance groups. And you know, this is kind of a very succinct overview of Kafka and traditional messaging. The point being that you know, even if Kafka solves a lot of the problems of distributed systems, is actually not a silver bullet for. Uh, you know, for all the for all microservice communication. Putting Kafka on the map raises a second problem, which is how do we run these things at scale? Like all of a sudden, not only we have a distributed system that consists of a ton of microservices, but actually we have to run a messaging system that is a distributed system in and by itself, right? And this is where platforms like Kubernetes come into play. For the, one, for, the, for the ones of you that are familiar with Kubernetes, I think some of these things will not be new, but I'm going to try to kind of level set a conversation for, for the rest of the audience. The key ideas are this. The key idea is this. First, that you know, the, the concept of virtualization that has made possible for, um, har for hardware to be shared between multiple logical virtual machines is essentially taken to a next level, allowing data, al allowing the same machines to share isolated processes, which are containers that, are, like, that have like, really well-defined boundaries in terms of CPU, memory, and file system, while sharing the same core. This makes them you know, less isolated than VMs. So that kind of, that's, is a trade-off in general. But let's make them faster, less overheady, and gives more flexibility when you run these systems. Like when you think about dividing a physical machine and multiple VMs, those, those VMs, yes? That's just letting uh, the Perfect. Way. Thanks for letting me know. These, um, they, they achieve this sort of, they, they allow you to run things at higher density than you would be able if you would have to slice and dice things in virtual machines. You know, you can have more a more dynamic allocation of resources inside a machine inside a running machine to the containers. They also allow you to create immutable, um, you know, immutable uh, deployment units, which are container images. So you can package not only the application but actually the you know the JVM that you're running the application on, uh, you know, some libraries and all this kind of stuff, which is hugely beneficial when you actually try to have a re highly reproducible runtime, rather than trying to figure out like how why your application that's running Tomcat here doesn't work anymore when you're moving on a different version of Tomcat in production. Right. So that's a big win, and of this consistency and this density. And you know, they they're kind of they're a good match. They hit the soft spot for microservices in terms of isolation, packaging, and you know, structuring. 
The problem, again, is that when I mean, you have to run hundreds of these things, density and packaging are not the only things that you have to worry about. You have to worry about lot, a lot other things. Like what happens if one of these components crashes? And now you have a hundred of them. So you have to think about what happens if one of the nodes on which one of these components crashes? Like what if the entire machine goes down, takes all the containers with it? How do you know what was running where? You have to go and restart them and you know, all this kind of, do all this kind of work. How do you configure networking so that some components are more isolated than the other and so on? How, you, how do you allocate things like memory, CPU in a consistent fashion, right? Uh, how do you do monitoring or failover, right? And this is essentially where platforms like Kubernetes come into play. They start to provide this capability of running containerized applications out of the box, right? They make this, like they make the environment in which you deploy your containers yeah, yeah. very transparent, right? You know, and then comes other, come other features like that you can come on top of that. Like how do you add routing to the various applications? How do you expose these applications to the outside world? How do you do things like CI CD, for example, consistently as part of the platform? So in a way, I think you should think of, of Kubernetes essentially as a building block for building distributed solutions, not necessarily as a do-it-yourself platform for building distributed solutions. And this is the reason, for example, why we're, you know, Red Hat is developing OpenShift as a distributed platform that's based on Kubernetes, adding the other features that are kind of necessary for, for development. It's not being necessarily a pitch, but just kind of a coming back to the reality that just working with the basic component has always been a painful thing. You have to think about it. Now, running applications on Kubernetes is easy when you're uh, when you kind of work with the uh, with the basic components. Of, of, the, of the system, right? It's, you can containerize them, you can run them, you have things like pods and deployments and uh, you know, different, like, uh, different constructs at the, um, you know, in Kubernetes that's, that are designed for running these, uh, for running workloads and for running applications. How about things like messaging infrastructure? How about things like Kafka, which are a little bit more complex and require more, like have, have different requirements, have, have more stringent requirements for resource <coughs> access, for identity, and all this other stuff. This is why you know, the, um, there are a number of projects we developed like at Red Hat, a team at Red Hat actually with some help from community, with some help, for example, from Lightband. Uh, so it's, it's, Streams is essentially a community effort that's spearheaded by Red Hat for developing a tools for running Apache Kafka on Kubernetes in by extension on our version of enterprise Kubernetes OpenShift. What is the, what, what are the foundations? What are the critical problems that are, that we talk about in this space? First, we, again, you don't have to, and don't take this as from now on, you should go back home and run everything that you have on Kubernetes. Kafka works just fine if you run it on VMs and you, know, you have your topology and your infrastructure people are running like that. But if you're running your applications on Kubernetes already, it kind of starts making sense to ha have a single type of infrastructure where things are running. Also, when you want to think of, 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 uh, of messaging as a service offered by the platform, it makes sense to start offering as part of the uh, offering it as uh, as part of the as a platform itself. Kubernetes is actually great at handling things like oh, a broker crashes, I'm going to restart it. Uh, I'm I'm going to have to expose the different brokers as shared services so that other applications in the system can access. Them. You know, the problem is that Kafka requires a, a lot more. It requires a stateful identity. It requires ways for, you know, it requires durable broker states, like persistent storage. It requires the ability to restart 
in the same, in the same state where, where uh, the application left after a failure. So this is basically where things like you know, stateful sets as, as, uh, as Kubernetes constructs help. How many of you have used stateful sets with Kubernetes or are familiar with the notion of stateful sets? So stateful sets, like by initially, the long and the short of it is that Kubernetes constructs are, have been designed, generally speaking, for stateless workloads. You know, load balancers, uh, you know, deployments without identity, scaling, that kind of stuff. Generally speaking, they do not assume that those applications are anything else but identical to each other. And, uh, you know, and you can basically divide work as well as you want between them. Stateful sets are a new addition. Actually, they're not that new. They've kind of been around for uh, for two years now, but it, uh, kind of an evolution of, the, of that notion that give each pod in Kubernetes an identity and access to individual persistent volumes. The long and the short of it is that if you have an application running as a stateful set, each one of these instances of the application is going to be uh, indexed and is going to get access to a dedicated volume. Once the application was the pod crashes and it's restarted, it will restart with the same index and the same volume. That is, that helps a lot, right? That helps a lot with running Kafka. The question is whether running Kafka itself as a, uh, you know, but running Kafka as a distributed system, is it enough, for example, to just deploy a bunch of stateful sets, use the native components, and just kind of put some YAMLs together, containerize everything you have in the brokers for Kafka and for Zookeeper and everything you have, and just throw it like that on, on, a, Kafka, on a Kubernetes cluster and just get things going? And our answer is no, even if that has been common practice for, you know, for early adopters and for, for, for users that have adopted earlier uh, Kafka on Kubernetes, right? There are other operational practices that you, know, that you have to take into account when you are running a Kafka cluster. And not only Kafka, I think what, what's, what I'm saying here applies in, in general. How many of you are familiar with the operator pattern in Kubernetes? So the operator pattern is basically a deployment model. It's based on the idea that while Kubernetes gives you some very good building blocks, as I said, for running services at scale, for managing health, for managing everything else, some, pro some deployment process, some certain processes require more operational knowledge. You have to start things in a certain order you have to do more operational work for these components. Two examples. You want to start Zookeeper before you start Kafka. How many of you have tried to run Kafka without Zookeeper? No? Not much? Well, how many of you have tried to shut down Kafka, uh, to shut down Zookeeper on a running Kafka instance? It's not nice. I have to say that. It's not pretty. So basically, having, having to solve these ordered, like order interaction problems is already something that's more complex than what Kubernetes has to offer. Doing things like, hey, I want to have, uh, I want to have um, secure interaction with my brokers, um, and I want to have certificates generated for them, and I want those certificates to be changed automatically, and you know, whenever without starting the brokers, and when or when I have when I want to do an upgrade and I want to change the image, I want to have the brokers restarted in a very specific order so that I have control over how how things you know how things progress may be different than the order in which uh, you know stateful sets start. Stateful sets by themselves do not allow you to scale easily from, you know, in the same way as you scale, uh, uh, you know, stateless deployments. So the operator pattern is based on two notions. 
first, that Kubernetes as a platform is extensible. Now, when you think about Kubernetes, Kubernetes has these notions of a pod, of a deployment, of a container, like all kinds of things that you can deploy in Kubernetes. It also allows you to declare new types of resources and new types of applications, really other Kubernetes deployments that become part of the API and act on these resources. So essentially what, what StreamZ does for operating Kafka at scale, essentially it has this notion of a cluster operator that monitors or installs a custom resource, which is a Kafka cluster. There is a cluster operator that monitors for Kafka cluster resources, like really YAMLs deployed in Kubernetes. And when it finds one, it finds a new one or finds one that's changed, you know, it starts deploying a cluster or altering it. Now, there is nothing new here. This is how Kubernetes works for any kind of deployment. When you're trying to deploy a new pod or a new service or you know, uh, <clears throat> in anything you have, uh, really, you will put a YAML into the system and the controllers will actually come in and start creating the applications and instantiating and doing the work. So in that, in that, in, in that sense, the operator here does what Kubernetes does at a higher level of, of abstraction and in the, with a higher level of, of a Kafka resource, of a, of a resource which is a Kafka resource. It also works with two other operators. So there are two smaller siblings. It's basically turtles all the way down, when you think about it, that act on new resources. So for example, it makes it possible for creating new Kafka topics um, in Kubernetes in, in, in the Kafka cluster without necessarily having to log in and administer the Kafka cluster to the command line or any other mechanism. So you can declare things that belong to Kafka as Kubernetes resources and let the operator kind of act on that. Right. So that's basically, that's basically the principle of, of how, the, uh, uh, how the operator works and how the, how the applications are basically brought together. The point is that the operator handles, and we're going to see a quick, a quick demo in a minute, not only the deployment of the new resources, but actually kind of takes care of making those servers available as, uh, you know, available across the cluster, makes sure that each application that accesses those servers, if you remember when I said first, clients need to have access to directly to the pods. So it creates the scaffolding that those clients will use for actually going directly, uh, for, ac for accessing the pods directly, right? And talking directly to them um, in a secure fashion. It uh, manages the, like if you have, for example, secure clients, it manages the security of those components and a few other things. And I'd like to go quickly, I don't have time to go over Kafka streams, unfortunately, because I think we're going to be a bit, like we're going to be, a, I would like to go to the demo, and if you have time, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk a little bit about Kafka streams. But as part of the demo, we're going to have a Kafka streams application, and we're going to take a quick look at that and how, how it works. Right. I'd like to start, though, I'd like to show you real quick how the operator works and how we run, actually, Kafka on on, uh, on an OpenShift instance. So I have this deployment of, everyone can see, of OpenShift in the cloud. And what I have is, so as I said, OpenShift is Red Hat's enterprise Kubernetes. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a new project called StreamZ, which is essentially a Kubernetes namespace. I just want to have like everything in a, in a nicely in a single place. So now if I go here and I'm looking at it, I see an error because the certificate of this thing is self-signed. But if I go back, <clears throat> I see that I have nothing in that namespace, nothing runs. So the first thing that I want to do 
is I want to log in into this system. I'm logged in already. And now what I want is to deploy the operator. And deploying the operator actually requires a few more things. Like there are, there are a number of resources that get deployed here. I need to deploy the custom resources, like things like the Kafka, like the definition, the notion of a new, what to create essentially a new domain object in Kubernetes that describes the Kafka cluster. I have to deploy a number of permissions. I have to create accounts that actually kind of manage access to these things because the operator is actually a very powerful thing. But I'm just, From an operational point of view, and this is I'm using a, you know, a distribution of streams that I, I just downloaded, it's really just a command line and I'm just installing these components directly. So as you see here, I have these new custom resources and I have the cluster operator. Now this is where it becomes interesting because my cluster operator is starting and we'll start monitoring the, um, We'll start monitoring the namespace for new resources. Let's see. It's not ready yet. It downloads the image. So one of the reasons why I want to run this is basically because uh, I really want you to have everything fresh on a fresh new OpenShift slash Kubernetes instance. So now, this is running basically on Amazon, so you don't have to worry that it will take a lot because of the network. So it's faster. I have everything running here. So <clears throat> this pod, essentially, if you look at the log real quick, it will say, well, it says a number of things, but it says, look, I'm starting to monitor this namespace. Now I can start to deploy my Kafka clusters. And my Kafka cluster definition is something like this. Basically, a Kafka, a new resource called Kafka. It's very much like a pod or a service or anything like that. And I'm going to deploy three broker replicas and three Zookeeper replicas. Right? And I'm going to use the default settings for the entity and the topic operator. We're just going to take a look at how the topic operator works. But first, let me just deploy this resource. So I'm going to say, um, let's see, uh, I can, it's the same thing. I'm going to call it production ready Kafka cluster. It's just a name, really. So now it makes a remote call. And it says Kafka, the production ready Kafka has been created. What's happening in the, what's happening is the operator basically detects that a new resource called production ready of the type Kafka has been created and starts acting on it. What does it mean acting on it? It starts creating the different parts of the deployment. It starts deploying Zookeeper, right? And it will deploy Kafka, and as you see, everything happens in a very specified order. First, it waits for the Zookeeper instance to start, then Kafka, then everything else. It does a few more things. So that's when I ta start talking about the complexities that are coming with, with running Kafka and running Kafka at scale. Um, for example, Zookeeper is not a, uh, Zookeeper in and by itself is not a secure, does not use a secure protocol. So Kafka and the default communication between Kafka and Zookeeper is through an unenc to unencrypt, through unencrypted TCP. That's something that you make, that is gonna make your security guys very happy when, you find, when they find out, right? So what, for example, a part of the, part of the operator work is to enrich the, um, the Zookeeper pod definitions with sidecars that tunnel the communication between um, 
it, it's actually enriching both the Zookeeper and the Kafka uh, pods with uh, sidecars that basically tunnel uh, the communication uh, through encrypted, uh, through TLS encrypted uh, TCP IP communication. And you see, as you see the, the, the node, the Zookeeper node is starting, the production ready Kafka node is starting, and that's super cool. And while it starts, let's just go here a little bit back and say, I want cube control get Kafka. And, you know, Kafka is not a normal Kubernetes resource. Like, it's not the same thing as Kubernetes pods. And yet, now that I have defined this custom resource called Kafka, I can get information about it. Right? Um, <clears throat> And, you know, once the Kafka instance starts, I get the, you know, the last component that deploys is the pod, the, the entity operator. And we're going to see exactly what the entity operator does in a moment. But let's look at the few other things that Kafka, that the operator has done here for the deployment. Remember when I said that each pod needs to be exposed as an individual address, right? So here it is. Clients have clients connect to a single to a single address to a single service. They can connect essentially to any of the brokers. But once they connect it to a broker, that broker will tell them the topology for uh, like of the entire cluster, and based on what topics and partitions they're interested in. What are the addresses of the brokers that have, have those topics and partitions, right? So essentially, the, okay. if you look at the, um, look at the pods, let's take a look quick look at one of the pods, right? <clears throat> if you look at the pods themselves, for example, each pod is configured with a, with, <clears throat> has a configuration that tells it's advertised host information that basically describes its advertised listener information that communicates what is its address for the for other services to connect with right so again the the deployment the controller actually takes care of this uh, of configuring this as well now it's going to be even more interesting if and I'm not sure if we have time, if we want to configure this application for external access, right? I think we're going to run out of time. So I'm going to send a few resources. What we want to do, what we would want to do next, and I'm just going to run this while we take a look a bit more at the, at the cluster, is essentially to deploy a few applications. And we have an input application that's essentially a Spring Cloud Stream. All of them are Spring Boot apps. All of them are Spring Boot apps. Uh, this is a Spring Cloud Stream application. It's just a Rust controller. The other one is a Camel application that receives the word counts. So this is just an application. The first one is an application that receives uh, lines. The second one receives word counts. It just as a word count object, it's a Camel application, just you know, connecting to a service. And the third one is a Kafka Streams application, and this is just kind of a, give you a quick, uh, a quick glimpse into it. That um, basically, so Kafka Streams, Kafka Streams, in addition to the kind of the client and and uh, the client and uh, the producer and consumer libraries that Kafka comes by default provides a DSL for doing stream, stream processing and especially stateful stream processing. The key is that it comes with these abstractions of a stream and a table 
the stream representing essentially an abstraction on top of a Kafka topic, and the table essentially being another abstraction of, on top of a Kafka topic, the idea being that any table can be represented by the changes you make to it and by persisting all the updates in a stream. So internally, Kafka streams kind of coordinates, imagine that you have an application that does word counting, right? And want to, wants to emit new word counts, you know, every second based on what it had at the input. Of course, you have to keep track of the input topic and the output topic, but you have to keep the state, the intermediate state of the, of the word counts somewhere. And if the application crashes, you want to be able to uh, reconstruct that. So this is what, what essentially what Kafka Streams does. It builds this abstraction on top of Kafka so that it, co it can coordinate all the operations by talking to a single Kafka cluster. This would be, for example, much more difficult if you would keep data in Kafka and the database because you, know, you would have to think about distributed transactions. Kafka doesn't even support distributed transactions, you know, compensation sagas, and so on and so forth. So they manage this, this type of, of, of uh, distributed state and distributed stateful processing by concentrating all the operations, all the state updates operations towards, towards Kafka, right? Jonathan. Are we still good, or? Um, how are we for time? Uh, it's like 10 to, I believe, but we'll do that after that. Okay. Okay. So, this was kind of a World War tour of, I was hoping to end up with running the applications. Let me just start real quick to deploy them. It should take a couple of minutes. Yes. Uh, this one is 3.11, the one that I'm running on. You can run it on 3.11 or 4. So the question was what, which version of OpenShift are we using? I'm sorry? They support the operator. So the question was whether 3.11 supports the operator. It's the Kafka, the streams the operator is not implementing using the operator framework. Which is only support, which is only in technical preview right now, but the the streams the operator is supporting production on OpenShift. So I know I'm starting these applications. You can see the <clears throat> builds starting. and I'm going to start a new build. So I'm using right now, I'm using the Fabricate uh, Maven plugin, which basically what it does is it builds the jar locally, and then it defers to a source to image build pipeline on OpenShift to actually build the containerized images. For those, uh, uh, for those projects. What's the advantage of doing that? First, it kind of, it, you don't have to run Docker on your machine. And second, it, there is like, it gets around some of the restrictions of running these processes. But the third advantage is that if you change the base image for these, uh, like if the base image for these builds changes, for example, there is a security update the image processes will actually pick up the new image and will redo the builds for you. So let's say you have a security fix in Linux and you know, that, that's, the kind of, that's the kind of thing that happens in the base image and you want to release that or a, or a Java security fix for, for the base image, then the build process will actually pick up and, and redo the build for you. 
Unfortunately, one thing that I didn't count on was that if I run the build from my machine, it actually has to push the jars up to the remote server, which is the reason why you don't get your tweets on your phones anymore because the network is saturated right now. So I think this is unfortunately is going to take a while because uh, the network is too. Oh, it actually got. Now they got. Okay, they started getting published. Hold on, it heard me. It's still going slow. So unfortunately, from, from my local machine over the local network to the cloud is actually taking some time. Um, I, what I could have done is just run the builds from uh, directly from the GitHub repository and setting up like that. But um, unfortunately, we're out of time for that. So what I like to end up on is you know, with the notion of um, running the operator for, like, I, I want you to kind of end up with the, this image of, you know what, if I build distributed systems, I have to think about where I run them, and I want to have a platform that can run them at scale. And I want a platform that is able also to run my, my messaging system at scale. And if I ha run something like Kafka, for example, I have to think about where I want to run it, like, kind of have my infrastructure team take care of it. Or maybe have something, some of part of running that deferred to the platform. And this is where things like the operator come into play. And you come back with the idea that uh, you can have something like a uh, very, very simple um, resource like this definition over here, right? Like this Kafka definition it basically trigger the deployment of a very complex infrastructure, right? And if I think about doing other things here, you know, I'm going to do one last thing. Editing one of these resources, for example, can cause, like if I want to create a new instance, I want to scale this up, for example, I can just go and change one of these characteristics. So for example, I want to create a new, I want to scale this up to five. Now, acting on this resource, you will notice that, you know, my instance is actually kind of declaratively, I, I changed the topology, I changed some, some of the characteristics of this topology, right? And I think that's the biggest strength of this, of this particular model, the notion that I can just kind of express what I want from the system, and then you know, there are going to be components that act on it and kind of bring this, this at scale. And that's, kind of, that's the, kind of the main notion besides the importance of event-driven architecture, which I think we can buy on, and event-driven architecture in microservices and so on. I'd like to kind of come back to this, to this notion and have this image of, of this model of operating these microservices as, at scale. And I, I'm afraid that I'm, we're late, so I'm not going to take the questions here, but Please, let's go for a drink and ask anything you want. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.